I'm JV Leary with CBS 4 News in Denver. We are thrilled to be able to provide this special look at the Highlands Ranch Triceratops find. And while we wish we could be with you in person, we are all working together apart, and we hope you enjoy as we take the time to reflect back on this incredible find. Oh, yes. <laughs> Let's begin with the woman who gave us unfettered access to her life at work. Denver Museum of Nature and Science Chief Fossil Preparator Natalie Tote. We were in her face constantly, and while she didn't always enjoy it, it gave us an incredibly unique look at what it takes to make an urban dig site work. Here's Natalie. I remember that Tyler had mentioned that he got a call, or got an email with a bunch of photos in it, and he's like, we gotta go out to the site, we're gonna go check this out, they might have found something. And so we get out and we go and I meet with the you know, guys in their office and they take us out to the area where the bones are coming out and we look at the hillside and start to kind of poke around a little bit and you know, I'm expecting that there's going to be maybe one chunk of a fossil there, but the more and more that we started kind of poking around the area, we saw four, five, six fossils coming out of the ground. And so immediately I think back to the field work that we do in other parts of the Rocky Mountains. And if we had seen something like that, you know, at a dig site down in southern Utah, you would say, oh my gosh, of course, we're going to dig in and explore this and see what else is there. After that kind of initial assessment of looking at what potential elements could be there and kind of doing the initial, you know, diagnosing of what we, you know, a field guess of what kind of fossils we thought were there. We decided, okay, we should have them kind of stop what they're doing and let us check out the area. As far as I can remember, they were really uh, easy to work with and super gung-ho and they were, honestly, they were really excited about it, which made it really easy. We brought the fossils back to the museum and we put them all behind the scenes in our storage facility and we had kind of decided okay we'll work on some of these fossils in our lab but since there were so many that were collected from the site we had 13 pallets worth of fossils from Highlands Ranch which is incredible truly to have that much of a fossil or that much of an animal represented. We decided that we would send some of the fossils out to help with the preparation of them so some of them are at the museum down in Hillsboro, Texas called Texas Through Time and the fossil preparator down there Andre Luhan he's helping us to work on the fossils. So as you can imagine, working on big dinosaurs can take a long time. So he's still working on cleaning off the fossils, but we do have some of the things in our museum that are done and they're part of our collection now. Is it very common to send fossils out to other uh, institutions, other preparators to get prepared? Yes, they, uh, our museum does that with other projects besides Highlands Ranch. So yeah, it's common. Last estimate I heard was this fall sometime, uh, which is good, right? Just a few months from now. So. so we know that there is a second smaller Triceratops whose fossils were mixed in with the big guy that we had initially found. And we didn't know that that second individual was out there until we started preparing the fossils and finding these kind of bonus parts of the skeleton that were in there that were much too small to be a part of the main dinosaur. And then there's also what we think is a second different type of dinosaur. So a duckbill dinosaur, something we call a hadrosaur, was also mixed in. But in terms of exactly what kind or how old the individual is or anything like that, we're not, not certain quite yet. I remember that when we were out at the site, we did our field guess and one of the elements that we had seen was the upper arm bone, the humerus and horned dinosaurs have a really specific looking humerus. So when we saw that, we knew, okay, it's a horned dinosaur, but we were careful not to say exactly which kind. Just a few years ago, we had diagnosed another dinosaur in Denver as a Triceratops, but it turned out to be a Taurosaurus, so, which is great. But yeah, once we had seen that element, we could confirm it was a horned dinosaur, and then it wasn't until a few weeks into the dig that we saw parts of the dinosaur's frill and other features from its skull that we were able to say, okay, this is a Triceratops. But in the field, you know, things like ribs are really easy to diagnose on site. They're just these big, long, spindly bones. But yeah, to see some of the fossils, we took a trip to Texas to see how the prep was going and just to see exactly what was in some of these big blobs of mud was really, really cool. <laughs> I hadn't heard that the Triceratops was involved in any kind of combat, <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, this dinosaur most definitely could have been walking alongside T-Rex, but we have no fossil evidence that there was a, a meat-eating dinosaur like T-Rex out at the site. So no combat that we can see, as far as I know, but 
again, we're still waiting for the fossils to get prepared. Who knows yeah. what could be in there? You can infer, right? So they do find fossils of other triceratops that'll have you know, bite marks on them, or they will have what we infer as evidence of combat with other horned dinosaurs. So you know, there's features that you can see on the fossils, but yeah. not at Highlands Ranch so far. <laughs> So Highlands Ranch, or really working at any active construction site, is complex in a different way than I feel like I'm used to. So we do a lot of field work in remote backcountry areas that requires a bunch of you know, logistical planning and really careful use of resources. Uh, we have to helicopter fossils out of the field, so that's really complex in a different way. But I mean, at Highlands Ranch, you're working alongside huge pieces of equipment. It's very much an active construction zone. So that whole safety facet of it is really tricky. And then also just making sure the fossils are safe too. I mean, we were working in this huge mud hole, you know, 20 to 30 feet below the ground surface that was just constantly being filled with water. So that was really tricky in another way. So yeah, I mean, absolutely. It was complex, it was difficult, but rewarding. So when we take fossils out of the field, what we do is encase them in layers of plaster and burlap. So I have an example of a small field jacket that we have in our lab. And what's really nice is the plaster dries and hardens and makes this really nice shell on the outside of the fossil. So it holds it, it protects it, it makes it really easy to transport back to the museum uh, in one safe, solid piece. When we get the fossils back into the lab, we use a whole variety of tools to clean the rock off from them. So we'll use a saw to cut open the field jacket and pop the top off. And then you're left with the fossil encased in the rock. And depending on how hard the rock is, we may need to use a tool like this. This is an air scribe. And you can see all these lines and kind of chisel marks that are on the outside of this rock. And that's from the air scribe that was used to slowly remove the rock layer from the bone. Uh, if rock is much softer than really, really hard stuff, we can use really simple tools. So things that hopefully everyone has at their home. So things like a toothbrush, paintbrush, um, even a scalpel is really helpful for removing rock. And then we use a whole different kind, whole variety of different kinds of glues to keep the fossils um, all stabilized and stuck together while we're working on them. So this is a type of glue called B72. It's just pieces of plastic dissolved in acetone that helps to really stabilize the fossil. Other times we just use different kinds of super glue or epoxies to glue big chunks or big pieces back together. At Highlands Ranch, we had a whole variety of different hardnesses of matrix or rock that encased the fossil. So we had some really, really hard sands and muds. And then we also had, since the whole site was so muddy, uh, what was kind of nice is that as the mud dried out and as we were working on the fossils, we were able to use really simple tools like scalpels and brushes to just brush away the soft mud that was covering the fossil. We are now in the Avenir Collection Center in the second level of the basement in the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And this is our Earth Sciences Collections. This is where all of our fossils are stored and held after they're prepared up in the fossil prep lab. This is their last stop. And this space is so great since all the fossils are stored in here, they're available for researchers to use from around the world. And in front of me here, I have the cheekbone and part of the upper jaw from the Highlands Ranch Triceratops. So th this is the, one of the fossils that we have prepared and completely finished removing the rock and the sand from, and now it's part of the integrated collections here in the Earth Sciences Department. So you can see that this is being held up by what we call an archival cradle. So it's a support structure that's lined with felt and fiberglass and plaster on the outside, and it helps to support the fossil while it sits on our shelves here in collections. So once all the other fossils from the prep lab are all cleaned, all the sand, all the mud, and everything is removed from their surface, it'll come down here, get one of these support cradles, and then be available for scientists to research from around the world. The Denver Museum, we're continuing to do research in the Denver Basin, which is this area between Denver, Colorado and Colorado Springs to the south. And we're continuing to look at all the fossils that we find deposited during this time period, about 68 to 66 million years ago. And so this Highlands Ranch Triceratops will contribute to that research as we continue to look at the fossils that were found in this area.
None of this work at Highlands Ranch would have been possible without the help from Brinkman Constructors, the Kelly Trucking Company, and especially without the help from our volunteers here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. So thank you. If there is one thing the Highlands Ranch find confirmed, it's that Colorado is rich with prehistoric history. We're here in Jefferson County at Dinosaur Ridge, where some of the best known dinosaurs were found. These rock formations are full of fossils, and we hardly expected to find fossils next to a senior retirement community in Highlands Ranch, but the right people came together to make sure they were taken care of. Introducing Craig Erickson. I remember it was early May, got a phone call from Dave Rahm. He's our project manager for Brinkman. And I was busy at the time, so I didn't take the call. About an hour later, he calls back, so I knew something was up. So, of course, I took the call, and he said, Craig, he said, I think we found a dinosaur. And I remember thinking, there's no way, that's not possible. He said he discovered something in a pretty deep hole they were digging and had said that the museum was on their way out to take a look at it. So we were obviously uh, pretty excited. As you can imagine, pretty big deal for us. And sure enough, the museum came out, verified that yes, we are sure this is a fossil. Don't know what type of a dinosaur it was, but uh, that was really exciting for us. As you can imagine, it was a big deal for us. We have about 1,600 residents who live here at Wincrest. The majority are independent living, so they were uh, all really excited about it. Obviously having fun as well with the jokes. Oh, we found our oldest resident. Uh, we hope we, they don't call us fossils, things like that. And of course, our employees were equally excited. Uh, if you think about it, dinosaurs are the coolest thing we learn about in school. Imagining these giant creatures lumbering across this land in a totally different climate millions of years ago. So it was a lot of fun. Every day I'd get some different trinkets that would show up in my office, dinosaur knickknacks and things. And so we had a, a great time with it as a community. remember when Dave told me about this, he said, you guys need to decide what to do with this. And I remember thinking, what do, you, what do you mean? And he said, well, there's no laws that govern what happens to dinosaurs in Colorado. And so he said, you have to decide whether you want to donate it to a museum, whether you want to keep it, or technically you could even bury it. I don't recommend that, but it's private property. So, um, of course, we were eager to give this to the community. We didn't have a need for a dinosaur and the Denver Mu Museum of Nature and Science has a great reputation here in Colorado. So we were really excited when they reached out, offered to oversee the whole process of excavation. I remember a couple days after that I got emailed a fossil transfer contract that had to send over to our legal team. Obviously we had never seen one of those within Erickson Living, our management company, um, but just really excited to have had that support of the museum. It was neat for our residents because we had a great overlook. One of the new buildings that we had just opened had a great view of the site, and so residents could go up there, watch the 15 or so museum excavators and volunteers every day. So they, they loved being able to see things. It was unfortunate that we didn't have a better access for the public. It would have been so neat. My kids go to school right next door. It would have been really neat to have allowed the public to come out to the community stand there and watch, but it just wasn't accessible in any safe way. So that was unfortunate. The museum was great to work with because every day they would give us film clips, updates. We have our own TV network on site, so we could show those film clips. They came out, did presentations for our residents. They oversaw the PR aspects of it. So the Museum of Nature and Science has been a great partner in all this. I know we were also fortunate that we had all this big construction equipment on site because they'd find new bones every time they found one. They would want to go further out, and because it was so deep, the, our contractor, Brinkman, they've done 10 buildings with us, been great to work with. They would send a backhoe operator out, clear off another 10, 20 feet of dirt in a matter of a couple hours, and so it was great having them on site with all that equipment. I talked with several residents who went to the museum and they've been excited because they said they were able to stand there and talk to the employees at the museum who are uh, chipping away at the pieces and glue, making sure the bones are all glued together. So they've enjoyed that and saying, I live there where they found that at Wincrest. So that's been neat. What we plan to do, the area we found it in is above a landscaped area near a parking lot. And so we're excited that we're going to commemorate this location about 40 feet above 
where the bones, the fossil was found, and we're going to have a play structure with a dinosaur theme that young grandkids who are out visiting our residents can play in. So we're really excited about that. That'll be opening up uh, sometime in the middle of 2021. A really neat thing about working with the museum, they had dealt with this before. We obviously hadn't, and I know up in northern Denver, uh, a similar triceratop relative was recently found, and so they had just kind of dealt with this a few years before, so they were great to help guide us through that. Also, knowing that new sites would want to be out, they took lead on all the public relations aspects, communicating directly with the news companies and inviting them out for events as well. So they were great to partner with through the process. I think all in, it took almost six weeks from when they started digging to when they finished the site and understand they found approximately 70% of the remains of the dinosaur. Yeah, it had a lot of inquiries that came across our desk and again, collaborated with the museum on those. It was neat seeing news stories and Australia and other countries uh, that had picked up on this story. So obviously, no matter where in the world you are, dinosaur find is a very unique thing. The most amazing thing for me was, one, trying to understand how long ago 66 to 68 million years was. It's almost unfathomable. But doing the research and understanding how different the climate and the landscape, this was a tropical almost marshy type of area. So that was just phenomenal to learn a little bit about how different the climate was 66 million years ago. Well, I did uh, drag my kids out one day on a Saturday. And even though it's not accessible, I have a four wheel drive. So arranged it with the contractor to come down there. And it was pretty neat to get some pictures of them standing in front of the volunteers who were chipping away with their little tools and brushes and for them to be able to see that in action. That's not something that a lot of kids have a chance to do. So that was really neat for us as a family. We heard from many different perspectives throughout the course of the Dinosaur Hunter documentary, but one of the perspectives that we didn't hear from was from the man behind the camera with whom none of this would have been possible. Mark, get over here. Introducing Mark Nitro. You hardly saw him on camera. Let's get you a microphone here. So I thought we would talk to him. First of all, Mark, how long have you been a photographer for? Well, I've been at... Longer CBS. than I've been alive. <laughs> CBS Denver for 20 years. Yeah. Um, I graduated from Oregon State in 1992. So yeah. since 92, so... You've been hauling that camera around. years or so. Wow. In various spots, Air Force, here, Santa Barbara. So I've been around. Thank you for your service, by Thank the you. way. Yeah. How heavy is that camera, would you say? 25 pounds. Has it gotten lighter throughout the course of your career? It has career? not. Well, which leads me into my next question. I mean, Mark is lugging this camera around with him on so many different varieties of shoots, but this one was more physically demanding, a lot of different challenges. Um, but this was not your first dinosaur shoot, we'll say. Tell me about your first one. My first dinosaur shoot was in Thornton, Colorado. It was a Taurosaurus that they found up there. It was found at a site where a police and fire station was being built. And so we did, a, uh, I think, three weeks there or so, probably, a total, for them to unearth that dinosaur. And we did another documentary about that one. And that was also a construction site, right? Yeah, another construction site, but it was the police and fire station being yeah. put in. Yeah. And uh, the dinosaur bones are actually, the casts of them are actually in the floor, in the lobby of the police station right now. So oh, wow. when you walk in through the glass, you can see what, what it looked like down below. We did another one, too, though. We went down... Um, Oh Colorado yeah, Colorado Springs. Springs, that's right. That was incredible. They found some fossils from a period of time in Colorado Springs that they didn't have any fossils from. And, and so it kind of helped answer a gap in between what happened when the dinosaurs died and when life first started to evolve. So I think that was a really cool find as well. I mean, we are in one of the coolest spots to find fossils and traces of these prehistoric creatures. Well, and, and down there, which is so unique, and if, if you ever have, have a chance to go down there, I would definitely make the trip. Um, Corral Bluffs. It, That's it. it. It is so neat because the fossils are actually at the surface. And so down there, we're walking, and Jamie points down and says, that looks like a tree. And, and then the, the scientist we we're, were with says, that's actually a petrified tree, a palm tree. Petrified palm tree stump. It was incredible. So what I really want to ask you about is if you could summarize this 
last find in Highlands Ranch of the Triceratops. If you could summarize that period of time that we were shooting for in, in one word. I'm looking for one word to describe <laughs> how this was from your perspective as a photographer, editing it all, helping me write, all of it, putting it together. If you could use one word to describe, we'll call it an adventure, our adventure, what would you? See, I have many different words, but <laughs> the one word would be an adventure, I think, because to sum it all up, because yeah. Exhausting would be a word. Mm -hmm. um, the editing process is exhausting. Then there's the heat. Yeah. And then there's well, the Well, actually, the back mud. up. How many days? We had actual days logged. We had maybe 25 days of footage or longer than yeah, that. Yeah, I, I don't remember the, yeah. the, the number of hours, but I had 20 something discs. Mm -hmm. um, so and, and you, okay, then the mud was the challenge, and you had that 25 pound camera in the mud and the, talk about that so i think it just all adds up it, which is i couldn't i wouldn't do it any other way but it's <laughs> right it's it's the heat it's the mud on top of that that working condition of long hours but then you know luckily you have such great people at the museum that and the scientists and the, the volunteers that we all became friends it we was did. fun it was yeah. fun to do it and it was we were, they were doing science and having fun doing it well not to mention he's working with a reporter in the heat and the mud who has to memorize lines and frequently has, how, how many takes on average would you say sometimes when we're tired? 10. So, you know, it's, it's about working together well and working together with the museum and working together with um, Erickson Living, the construction company, Brinkman Constructors. They're, they're so great, but all, the mm -hmm. whole community around there. Well, without that cooperation, obviously, it could have easily been bulldozed right over and they never would have had this find and I think it was cool to have everybody involved in it. You know another thing I was thinking of is we normally don't get involved in the story that we cover. Mm -hmm. Normally we're behind, I'm behind the camera, Jamie's maybe pointing out some things but we know with this one that we got invited in to go and, and get dirty and mm -hmm. learn. What was that like for you? It was my very first time. It was really incredible to see all the work that went into it and I think the thing that stood out to me most was when I first got to the fossils I was afraid to touch them. I was afraid to touch them. Then they gave me a tool, a very sharp tool to kind of pick the dirt around it. And I said, I can't believe that you're giving me a sharp tool around, you know, these fossils from so long ago. And uh, they said the first rule is, you know, don't be scared uh, because it's, it's incredible. Obviously, they're very delicate. And I think a lot of people don't realize that when they're when they're doing that digging and they accidentally break something or there's times where like in the last one I did up in Thornton, they have to break it to be able to get down and, and kind of move things around. So in Thornton, they actually had to break a rib to get to some other bones. But then it's all just a jigsaw puzzle to them. When they go back to the lab, they grab their glue and they glue it all back together, just like a little jigsaw puzzle. Yep. Full disclosure, it's it's easy to break and you do have to be careful. And that's what the professionals are, are there for. These volunteers know their stuff. They know the difference between where the mud stops and where the fossil begins which I did not, and full disclosure, I didn't say this during the documentary that we did, but I did break a fossil. They said I had gone too far, uh, but it, again, not a huge deal, it happens. And I'm sure all these volunteers started somewhere and they are able to use their special glue and put it back together. And a lot of the pieces you see in the museum are fragments of pieces uh, that they found elsewhere and glued together. So. Um, well, I think the way that they break too also is so, helpful for them when they put it back together because when they break it breaks off like that puzzle piece instead of just a, a loose like sand you know like kind of break or something yeah let's do peaks and valleys maybe we'll start with the low and end with the high <laughs> <laughs> no I, I think the low is they're long days it's early in the morning till sundown and really. we're still working and the they're still working day. yeah and they're and, still and working and so in most days we would come in in the morning shoot until two or three o'clock four o'clock mm -hmm. and then go back to the newsroom and then tell another story for that night mm -hmm. to be able to have the time. And there's some days where they'd let me go down and I would spend all my, my entire day down there. Mm -hmm. But it, it was long days, the, the heat, uh, the mud, uh, yeah. it was incredible as far as, you know, I, I'm fine getting my shoes muddy and my, but getting the, you know, the camera muddy. Or, I mean, you drag, <laughs> that mud was all over my car too and the plaster was everywhere. What, so peaks, one or two? Uh, just the people, right? Yeah. Um, George, I mean, just, you know, George out there was right. a character and Natalie is always so fun to work with. Mm -hmm. I mean, Natalie, she like brings that team together. Her attitude and her smile, she knows what she's doing. And then she has such a great attitude and brings 
you know, there's drinks out there, there's water, yeah. there's food, food snacks, yep. you know, sunscreen, whatever you need, they're ready for it. And so I think teamwork and working with those people and then just the experience of being able to share this find, you know, the, the find with everyone, that's the part for me. It's mm -hmm. people following me on Twitter and commenting and then kind of watching the progress and then seeing the documentary all the way through the process. You know, on the last one in Thornton, it was, you know, they found a T-Rex tooth. Yeah, oh really? Within the find, yeah. yeah. So there was a T-Rex tooth on top of the Taurosaurus bones. Yeah. But I think what a, an exciting opportunity for people that live there um, that are able to say that you know, there was a dinosaur found yeah. right there, something to, for them to show their families. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. And thank you to the Highlands Ranch Historical Society for being with us. Although it's not in person, we're happy that you were able to share this look back on the historic find virtually. Thank you also for your passion in preserving history. I'm Jamie Leary for CBS Denver.